Keone, what would you say to those that have been turned off to the faith that are, you know, around our age that, you know, have their whole life ahead of them and maybe their parents, you know, brought them to church on Sunday and forced them to go and they didn't like that. They never understood the why. Why should they reconsider? Well, I would just take a look at the times now and reflect on the life that you're, you're living and is it, is it working for you? Um, you see so many people who are like to be rebellious and to be like anti-Christian is like cool now. It's like the new thing. And, you know, like, I don't believe in God. I'm about the spiritual. I'm about the vibes and energy. And the world is in chaos right now. And so if someone were to tell me that, like, ah, oh, nah, you know, I'm, I, don't, I don't need that faith stuff. I think it would just kind of speak to a wound that they have or something that may have happened to them. Because at the end of the day, you can't love something that you don't know. And they just don't know. And so I would kind of just break open that conversation. What is it that you're misunderstanding or what is it that you have been um, not told from someone who, you know, in your life, whether that be a family member or whatever that you don't know about and just have that dialogue. And I think once you understand, like my dad was saying, the why behind the faith, it completely transforms you because take it from, you know, guys like us, that, like you said, like, you don't expect us to be all about it, but the reason why we are about it is because of that why. And that why strengthened us to just drop everything because of how powerful that why is. Mm. Miko, would you add anything there? Um, I would just, I think it's really like, stop. If the, the thing you consume and read the most is tweets, then like maybe put your phone down for once. Cause like, I don't know. There's so many arguments that I hear, especially in college, like being in college in my third year. And I see a lot of my friends, they go to school and all of a sudden they're on the ultra left and, you know, saying a lot of crazy things about the church and society. And it's like, I think people really need to start to just to educate themselves and stop looking at Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter all day. It's just like making you use your lower faculties of just like pleasurable pictures and then you're dumbing down your brain and things like that. And to like go outside, like this is so many arguments I hear today that sophists were making in 400 BC. And it's just like, you know, if you're going to come with something, at least try to, you know, and there's so many things like that. Well, not only, I'd, I, that's the only thing I'd add really to Keone is that I think a lot of these people, they go to college and they're trying to figure their life out and they are kids and they just want to party four more years and that's about it. And then, um, then we kind of figure out the rest of our life after that. And then we'll get married when we're 32, boss, maybe have one or two kids. And it's just this continue like dumbing down of our generations. And I think my biggest encouragement would be like, pick up a book, read Aristotle, Plato, read people, read Augustine, read all these people, like challenge yourself and stop just looking at your screen all day. Cause it's not helping you and it's not helping us. We're here today with the guys from Priest, Prophet, King that have an amazing YouTube channel and you have to subscribe. The reason you have to subscribe is because it's a father and two sons talking about changing the culture from within, bringing it back to Catholicism. When I found them on Instagram, I was blown away because I've always been like, man, I walk into a church and there's a mother and two sons, uh, a mother and their children. There's never the father there. Almost never. You know, obviously there's, there's dads they're representing, right? But it's such a tragedy to see the male father in the family not leading the faith. And here we've got John, who's an awesome Catholic speaker, leading his family in faith, so much so that his sons that are in their 20s are on, on fire for the faith and they have a podcast together. So guys, great to have you on. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, we thanks. appreciate it. Thanks, Ray. You hit the nail on the head, brother. We got, we got a man problem. Um, we do. Sure. <laughs> we do. Now, John, you, uh, you have some years of fatherhood on me. We're not going to say how many. We right, talked about right. that before we came on live, but... <laughs> How is it that you were able to raise your, I mean, you, look, let's be real. You guys are normal looking, good looking guys. <laughs> like, how, how'd you guys stay Catholic Appreciate and still that, like Ray. balance? Of course, Appreciate of that. course. Like, I'm sure a lot of my viewers were like, wait, what? These guys are Catholic? Like, they look normal, you know? Or maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe exactly. that was the wrong way to say it, you know? You know? <laughs> no, no, you're, and they're like, are they really Catholic though? Yeah. Are they, yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah. You, know, you know, a big part of it, there's a whole story behind it. And obviously we're not gonna go into my story necessarily, but it actually starts from really from the father leading and witnessing, right? I think um, I haven't always been a practicing Catholic. Um, I was raised, uh, I guess I was born into the Catholic family. And what you described as far as a mom with their kids was exactly what happened with my upbringing, where my mom was bringing us kids. I have, you know, uh, three brothers and a sister and bringing us to the faith. And what do you think the boys did in the family like? 
dad's not going to church. Why do I need to go to church? And so anyway, it, it affected my, uh, really my ability to kind of lead my, my family into the faith for a long time. And so there's a whole conversion story to that. But ultimately, once I had the metanoia moment, moment and was able to turn that around, um, the family follows, you know, when, when, as the priests of our home, you know, as, as men who are husbands and fathers, we, our kids are, are watching every step of the way, what we do, what we don't do, um, how we pray, if we don't pray, those types of things. So if God is important to definitely the father and social science will tell you that, then um, most things will fall in line. Awesome. What's been the greatest thing that you've gained by practicing your faith and really being all in for Jesus? I would say just like this fire and vigor for life. Like everything is so much more beautiful because you see God behind it all. And, you know, I, I do work right now for, um, I work with kids with severe mental illness and just seeing what they go through and with there's lives without a God, how like, how difficult that is. And to completely give every aspect of my life to God, obviously I can do that more perfectly as I grow and we all have that. But to see him in every aspect, it's so much more fulfilling and everything is so much more beautiful. And I think at the end of the day, you're filled with so much more peace. And that's something that I've really tried to work on in my life because I'm kind of anxiety um, driven is just being at peace. And when you like know that God is um, right there with you, when you have a, a strong relationship with him, when you practice the sacraments, he gives you that just overwhelming peace where you can just be. And it's like the greatest gift ever. Uh, I'd say for me, I think it's freedom. I think obviously freedom from sin, but I think freedom from noise in the chapel, um, freedom from just all the yuck and grossness of the world that they have to offer. Um, I think freedom to like actually feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing in my life. And um, I think, you know, I think I freely think the best and creatively when I'm in, when I'm, closest to God and state of grace in uh, the adoration chapel, all those small things. I think it's like a freedom to like really live how I'm supposed to be living and you could feel it. You know, I think speaking to Keone is like that sense of peace and it's like really taking that red pill and you're like, whoa, (laughs) you know, it's freedom from the Marx and Nietzsche influence that have, you know, infiltrated our brains for over 200 years and all these kind of things. Like you feel that freedom in, in every way. And I would just say, you know, um, we think about St. Irenaeus, right? The glory of God is man fully alive. And I think never we would, would we have guessed what God has in store for us because um, you couldn't even imagine um, the love that he has and, and, and the call that he has. And so I, I would say, you know, it is amazing to be Catholic. Um, you know, we were made for communion. You think about for us as Catholics, we talk about the beatific vision. We were made to be one with God. And I think um, th- that would be, that is the goal, right? Is to be one with God. And so if we can get a foretaste of that here on earth, which is the Catholic church um, and through the sacraments and through a sacramental life um, and surrendering our life to God so that we can be, be saints and be made, we're made for more. And so rather than, you know, um, I know a lot of people, especially as we just begin this new year, talk about, you know, the better you or the best version of yourself. Now we're called to be like God. And I think I don't want to be the best version of John, right? Cause the best version of John still isn't God. And I think uh, what we need to do is be Christ-like. And I'd say our faith allows, enables, and gives us the grace, God's the very divine life in us in order to live life to the fullest according to God's plan and will for us. Man, you guys did a great job. I I didn't even prep you with that question. So (laughs) that is amazing. Miko and Keone, this question is going to both of you, but Miko, you can answer it first because you mentioned it. You said, I don't want to be too Catholic, right? That's something that... uh, a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to be too Catholic or like, oh, they're too Catholic. Uh, can you uh, address that from your perspective and uh, Keone, you too? Because a lot of people watch this but might be like, oh, that guy, Ray, he's too Catholic. But they see you guys and they're like, oh, well. That's enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, so, well, for me, it's because, um, I don't know, like when me, when me and my dad were in the car, and stuff we just listen to a regular radio and then all of a sudden every time i come in it's patrick madrid and patrick coffin i'm just like okay like the 18th day in a row like I, we get it you know you're practicing your faith you're doing good dad all right right on you know it doesn't mean i i gotta do that now like it doesn't mean i have to convert because you you did have a huge conversion and it was just you know different things like my dad would, would say like they my mom and my dad started saying like 
the terms like the evil one. And I was like, what do you, who is the evil one? Like, what are you talking about? Like, why can't we just say the devil? You know, like no people would do it or things like that. And so there's just a lot of these things where I wasn't just used to a lot of it. And like um, my parents, you know, we grow up, we'd watch, you know, some America's Got Talent or Wipeout or something normal. And then they were just going to bed at eight and reading before then. And, and there's just a lot of different things that I just wasn't used to. And I felt like the normality I had before was just, I was losing all of it. And then I felt like, well, shoot, I, I like to, you know, just be normal and watch Wipeout and listen to the radio. Like, does that mean I have to stop now too? And obviously, you know, being 11, I think it's hard to grasp. And now I'm only 20, so it's still, you know, hard to grasp. But um, yeah, that, I think that was my point of view really is like all these things I thought were normal and were okay. Now, because my parents aren't doing them, do I have to feel like they're not okay? And because of that, I wasn't as an 11 year old, which I don't, I think it's pretty reasonable, not willing to change those things. And I felt like I had to, in order to become truly Catholic. Yeah. Kind of going off that, like a lot of it was, what am I going to have to let go if I become too Catholic? I don't want to be too Catholic because then I can't love basketball. Like I love, I can't love rap music. Like I loved it, you know, and still love. And I can't love the shows that we like to watch or my, um, the, the sports that I like to watch, whatever it was, I had to let go of so much stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to mass. I'm going to be Catholic and let people know about it, but I'm not going to surrender my entire life to living out my faith because then I have to let go of all those things that I felt God was going to take away, which we know, obviously God just perfects them and our relationship with them. But that was really hard because you know, I, I saw my dad making all these changes and we're so used to living a certain life. And you, now you have to say, well, are you willing to give up the things that you're attached to? And that's for us and living a certain life and being at that age, you know, I was in high school. I was like, I don't think I'm ready for that. And so that part of that being too Catholic was just, I'm not ready to let go of the things that I feel like God will take away if I dive into my faith when in all reality, it's the, it's the exact opposite. He's given us way more than we can imagine. Just the fact that we're even having this, this uh, episode right now and just meeting you and having a podcast with my family is just, I would have never even guessed if I was just hanging on to my sports team and my rap music, you know? Yeah, yeah. So can you talk a little bit more on that? Like, how, how do you balance that, you know? Because I know that, that it's, a, it's a popular thing to be like, oh, you know, if you're going to be like a real Catholic, then like you can't watch NFL games on Sunday or whatever. Like what, what's that, what's that balance that you found? I think it's just being temperate. Um, Cause there's nothing wrong with a lot of those things, right? They give pleasure because God, you know, wants to move your emotions a certain way and th there's a good in them, something virtuous. Like we all know, like without sports, I would have, I would have half the virtue that I have now. Um, because of the sports team and the grind and the rigor that my dad was talking about, you got to work. Um, and so my love for sports wasn't necessarily bad. It's when they became um, the end in and of themselves. And it was like something for like a vain purpose. I was playing basketball for some pride or some glory or because, you know, ball is life. That's my everything. That's when it becomes um, kind of distorted. And I think as far as balance, and I even brought this to Franciscan and that was, you know, I was playing, I played on the basketball team there and it was a huge part of me is saying, no, 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 we don't have to be on the team and just kind of treat it as like intramurals. Like we just kind of have fun. You can grind and, you know, put everything you have into the sport, but it can still be for the glory of God. And every practice is a prayer and you're still not doing it just for yourself, but for your teammates and for obviously God's glory, because you have a talent. And if you're not using the talent, then you're just wasting it. Um, so that was, that's something for me is um, the end changed. And when the end changed, it starts to modify your means and how you're approaching those things. And I, it really helped me temp, uh, temper those things. And so where it didn't become an end of them for themselves, but I got to enjoy them for what they were and become detached to them better. Man, I like that. That is so good. So what would you guys say if, uh, if someone came up to you and they were like, I don't want to be too Catholic. What would be your, your response? Because I know a lot of people that their mom was so into like, you know, being all this church, you know, going to church all the time and all this stuff. And they're like totally turned off to it. How would you, how would you approach that? And then, uh, so that's for you two guys. And then John, how as a parent, can you uh, avoid that? Like turning off your child to the faith by being so on fire for it? I would just ask them probably what they're afraid of. 
if I'm yeah, being honest. I think that's the biggest thing because I've been there and I was afraid of a lot of things too. And so I think it's the best thing to do. I don't know if there's a, you know, an answer or a verse you could throw out of them that would make them be like, okay, yeah, you got me there. All right, let's do it. I think I just asked, you know, what are you afraid of? And if you truly believe that there's a God and Jesus was on this earth, then what does that mean? I think I just probably asked those two questions. Mm. Yeah. Same thing. Like, you know, what does that mean to you being too Catholic? Like, what is it that's holding you back? And I think oftentimes there's that misconception of like being too Catholic means I'm not myself when it, obviously that's a complete lie and you actually become yourself when you dive into the faith. Um, but I think you have to start off with the same definition. When I, if someone would ask me that, like, what do you mean too Catholic? Um, and then you can break open that dialogue. And I think that's something that we really try to do in our podcast. It's just dialogue. We're just having a conversation and, and hopefully our listen, listeners can just kind of place themselves within that conversation. So just to see like what's on their heart. And like Meeks was saying, like, what is it that you're, that you're afraid of? What is it that you're holding on to? I remember a family member, a close family member once, once said to me as I was coming back to the faith, you know, not everybody's fanatic about the faith like you are. And it kind of took me back a little bit. And quite honestly, it hurt my feelings. I, was, I had to think about like, what do you mean fanatic? Like you call me a Jesus freak or what, you know, what does that mean? I'm saying it in a negative context as if, as if it was wrong to be in love with, with the Lord and, and our faith. And I thought about it. I'm like, oh, you mean fanatic? Like, you know, being a you know 45 year old adult and have a season pass to like Disneyland and go there like every weekend fanatic or like, or like a Raider fan. Cause we are Raider fans. Like, you know what I mean? Like painting yourself up and spending like 12 hours at the stadium and like going crazy and, and dressing up like it's Halloween every single Sunday, like that kind of fanatic or spending your entire Saturday watching every single game or, you know, whatever it is, um, you know, dressing up like a, a stormtrooper kind of fanatic, which, what do you mean? And I think for me, it was like, wait a minute, why is it that you, when you are passionate or you love something from a worldly sense, that that's admirable. But when it comes to your faith and you exhibit that same level of love and passion for God, that it's fanatical, that you're overdoing it, that you're being too Catholic. So I would question somebody's, I think the, the, the vocabulary, the framework, what is it you actually mean? But you can never, when, when you think about God, and again, I get, we get this a lot too, you know, um, you know, you can never love too much an infinite God who is infinite love, right? Whereas all these other worldly things you love and they just, you just come up short, you're more empty. So I would just say, you know, when somebody says too Catholic and all that other stuff, I think that's just, you know, the, the typical um, kind of labeling and really trying to justify your inability to really fully surrender your life to God. Because when you're talking about faith, there's never too much of anything else, especially when you don't apply that to anything else in your life, right? Nobody applies it to anything else in their life because um, there is a limit to the worldly things. But to your question where you talked about, um, you know, how do we not overdo it as parents, right? And I think there is a delicate balance. I think you have to understand. Um, and it's funny because I asked the boys the same question. I said, hey, parents are always asking me all the time, like, you know, I got, you know, you get parents today where they say, what? Well, I don't want to, I want them to make their own decision. I want them to own the faith. And that's a difficult thing because you feel like you're forcing your kid to go to mass every Sunday. And so I, I've had people ask me that question. Well, John, what do you think about that? And I said, well, let me ask you this. What, what language did you teach them when they were younger? And they were like, well, English. And I'm like, did they have a choice in that matter? Or did you teach them what you thought was best? They're like, okay. I said, what food did they eat when they, when they were younger? They're like, well, the food I gave them, I'm like, well, did they get to have a say so in that? I mean, or did, did they always want to eat peas when they were little, right? No, you made choices that were uh, based on what you thought was best for their development. Why is it any different with the faith? When it comes to their salvation of their souls, you should do everything and anything you can in order to lead them to Christ. And if they have an issue with that at some point in their life, 20, 24, hopefully younger, they'll come to realize that, wow, mom and dad will my good, right? And I think so as long as the kids understand the why, we've talked about this numerous times on numerous episodes about what's the biggest problem with us growing up in our faith is we don't understand the why, right? You're just telling me I have to do something, dad, rather than saying, look, we're going to pray a family rosary every weekend on Sundays because we're going to meditate on the life of Christ. Today is the Lord's day. We're going to give him back some time. We're going to pray for each other in our petitions for the upcoming week. So those types of things versus going, get over here and pray the 10 decades and shut your pie hole and kneel on your knees. And right. Well, I'm, I can be very militant in that way. So I think it's about um, explaining, articulating, but helping 
your family understand the why um, rather than just say, do it because I said so. Yeah, that is so good. Now, man, there's so much. So when, when you said the fanatic part, I thought that yeah. was so, so wise because people are fanatical about everything except for faith and they're yeah. praised for it, right? Like you said, the Raiders fan, like they're always on the commercials. <laughs> they're painted up and it's like, oh, that's something to aspire to be like. Or like the, what is it, Comic-Con or whatever? Like, yep. <laughs> and people dress up like, like that is like, so, I just think that's, I don't know, but you know, like, exactly. like who, like you're 45 years old, you're dressing up like a, like a stormtrooper or like baby Yoda, although baby Yoda is like super cute. So I kind of yeah. get that one, I'm just kidding, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? It's like, oh my yeah. gosh, like, don't we have responsibilities? You know, not to say that, that you can't enjoy things, but like, there are all those people out there that literally like, that's all they do. And everyone's like, oh man, that's so cool that they do that stuff. But that's like their life. And it's, what does that become? That's become an idol, really, you know, yeah. and, and God is about the business of destroying idols, you know, mm -hmm. even, even in, um, I mean, look at the world now. <laughs> it, it's so funny. All these Protestants are like, oh man, you guys, like you care so much about the saints or whatnot, but then like everyone's reading like tabloids to see what's going on with like the newest this and that or whatever. And it's like, okay, like, double standard you know what i'm saying <laughs> like not not to say that everyone that makes that claim does that but it's right. it's so interesting like we read the lives of the saints just like you read the lives of so-and-so whoever you know mm -hmm. like would i rather read a book written by someone that's you know not going to bring us any virtue or something that's going to help me strive for holiness you know now what uh what was a motivating factor like what helped you lead as a father that allowed you to raise your family catholic and not just nominal catholic but engaged zealous catholics great question i get that asked all the time um really it ended up being where i almost lost my wife and my family to be quite honest my wife's a convert to the faith um you know the kid's mom and she was uh she came from a non-religious background um we were church hopping because i was being a spiritual sloth and uh when we ended up at our home parish now she felt the presence of god in the catholic church and so that was really big for her. So that started the kind of bringing us back into the faith. So there's a long, windy road to that. But ultimately, it was my wife got tired of pulling the train. And I, I was faced with um, a, a real big choice and decision I had to make because I was not living out my faith. I had a lot of wounds and, and issues from uh, going through a lot of trauma in my, my, my own upbringing. So once I made that commitment and that choice and started to steer the Titanic of a family uh, ship around, I think it, it just took time and just witnessing first, you know, I had to have my own conversion. Um, I had, and then God, uh, through the grace of all the sacraments, specifically the sacraments of reconciliation and sacrament of Holy communion really, uh, nourished me to be able to do what I needed to do. And so it's just been a journey since then. And I think, you know, with the kids and the boys in particular, cause I think those are the harder ones. Our daughter came to the faith, um, actually before any of us did really, um, be because of Catholic friends, and uh, youth ministry at that point. But really, once I made that commitment, Ray, and then just really just chiseled away, you know, and, and worked out the things I needed to work out. I think the boys came to it, and I'll let them speak on their behalf, but really kind of came to see faith uh, lived in a different way than what they may have been exposed to early on in my uh, parenting years. Mm. So uh, that, that sounds really easy, right? <laughs> that, that, that you just like did it. <laughs> um, but if anyone, anyone that watches this channel, they know we, we get, we get deep. So what, what allowed you to grow in virtue? What were like some practical steps for all those fathers out there? And then also mothers that can show their husband this stuff to, to grow in that virtue necessary. Obviously you yeah. mentioned the sacraments. Yeah. I mean, I would say, um, when you're faced with a choice to get, to lose everything that you, you value in your life, um, you have to make some really tough decisions. How much, you know, what do you, and I, and I would challenge that to everybody out there, both men and women alike, but definitely men, what do you value in life and what are you willing to sacrifice for that? I think a big part of the issue with marriage and family right now is people don't understand the concept of sacrifice and self-denial. And so I had to face those myself. If my, if my wife and my marriage and my kids meant everything to me, um, how was I, what was I willing to give for that, right? And so I had to start with God first. Right? You got to get vertical before you get horizontal. And so it, it was a long process. But honestly, um, the big conversion moment outside of being faced with losing everything was um, 
really in the sacrament of reconciliation through a men's conference to a priest that gave it to me hard, right? Everything I needed to hear. Um, and, and I think most of the people, once they get to our YouTube channel, will be able to see some of that story because I tell that story often, um, especially to men. And it was just really that, that point. Like if, if, if something is of value to you and you're willing to give your life for it, I mean, that's where the rubber meets the road. And I think uh, it, it took the grace of the sacraments. It took a lot of healing. And honestly, I'm still going through a lot of that healing, but um, God has worked some crazy miracles in our lives. I don't have to look any further than myself, my marriage and my family to be able to see that. So I just, I would just say, you have to kind of make that decision. Nobody's going to do it for you. Nobody can want it more than you do. Um, you know, our, our kids, you know, your kids deserve uh, a chance, a shot at life, and they, they deserve um, what God has in store for them. And the best thing you can give your kids outside of faith is a holy marriage. And I think, you know, it's only through the grace of the sacraments. Only it's, it's amazing to be Catholic. And so uh, I, I would say it's going to, the grace, to get the grace and the virtue, it's a grind. And you have to be willing to commit. But it's no different than um, how we approach things in life, right? To be the best athlete, you got to go to work, self-denial. You got to get control of yourself. You got to have structure uh, when it comes to your career, profession, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. That is awesome, John. So, Keone, I know you're the older brother here. Um, do you remember a time where you weren't, uh, that, that your dad wasn't as on fire for the faith? Uh, and did you see that transformation or do you always remember him being in love with in Jesus. love with Jesus no the, uh, the I guess the conversion really happened when I was in high school I think mm -hmm. um, so majority of my formative most formative years were um, the BC dad I guess you can call it before conversion by before the way conversion <laughs> and um, so when he was having that conversion moment we actually butt heads a lot because um, I you know, I, I saw who my dad was becoming and I didn't, I didn't like it. And it, because, you know, as the priest of the home, he was changing how the family was run. He was changing his perspective as the leader. And I, as the oldest male in the home, you know, the son, I was, I was not having it. And so we would butt heads a lot. And I remember I would test him, like I used to test him, but he was responding completely different. And it was like, wait, what? And it took a long time probably into college really um, for me to accept the conversion and to love him past what was um, the pre-conversion version of him. Um, mm. And that had really strengthened our relationship to this day. I think this is why we're so close is because my dad remained consistent, even though he took beatings from us because of, you know, what we had to go through. So that consistency from him was like, all right, if he's about it, then eventually we have to be about it too. So Man, I love that. And I, I think that's so critical because to be a saint is to be consistent, right? Mm -hmm. In many ways, right? Especially in prayer, you have to be consistent in your prayer. You have to be consistent in patience. You have to be consistent in your virtue. Um, and practicing virtue will allow you to be consistent, but because um, we know that grace builds on nature. But mm -hmm. I mean, there are so many temptations to not be consistent and to just give in to sin and to just be like, oh, forget it. I'm done. I'm tired. Someone else will do it, you know? And that's really where being the father and being a man and obviously being a woman as well is so necessary. I, I, I see so many times where my wife, Anne-Marie, we have twin boys that are uh, 19 months old and they're crawling over all this stuff and have a dirty diapers all day long, you know? And she's just so consistent. And I'm so proud of her for growing in that virtue. And obviously I, I do my best to help her too, but you know, during the day when I'm working, I, I can't help as much. So it's, uh, it's really amazing to hear that that consistency was necessary. Now, mm -hmm. Keone, we'll go back into that, but Miko, I guess in hearing uh, what we've heard so far, you were younger when uh, your dad really came into the faith. Was it easier for you to make that adjustment? Uh, not as much. I mean, I was 11 and I wasn't trying to butt heads with my dad because my dad's six foot, you know, 200 pounds and I was like four nine. <laughs> so I wasn't really interested in butting heads with him. Um, but it was weird for me. It was just as weird as it was for uh, my brother or my sister. And so uh, we actually, I think we all bonded more so over the fact of like, okay, who is dad? And like, you know, where did he go? And what happened to him? And um, at first, I think it was some sort of rebellion to be like, I don't want to be that because it seems like he lost who we thought he was in a sense. And, it's, and he was really just losing, I guess, 
the bad stuff and he was gaining a lot of the good stuff. He was gaining virtue and he was extremely patient and all these different things that we hadn't seen before. And I think that change at such a young age um, just scared us and we didn't really know what to do with it. So you kind of rebel against that idea. I think for a long time I said, well, I don't want to become too Catholic. I don't want to become so Catholic that I lose who I think I am, even though that's not really what happens. You know, God just takes you and not, I don't want to say perfects you, but it makes you greater and it takes you above yourself. And so um, it was, it was difficult for me. I, I like Keone, it took me a long time. Um, I think a little bit like my senior year, I think is when I really started to um, try to accept God's ways and not try to make my own. Um, and so yeah, it took me a little while, but I think I had a really similar uh, experience. Mm. So all those people out there that are watching that are like, oh man, I really want to be uh, a great dad on fire for the faith and a, a, an incredible witness to my children. What we've already heard so far, right, is that we've got to be consistent. So that's like note number one, if you're taking notes. I wasn't planning on like having this like a note taking thing, but that is <laughs> super critical is to be consistent because I mean, that was years right? Yeah. 11 years old until a senior in high school. That is so many years. And obviously there's, there's different paths and whatnot, but I'm sure some of you watching are in that boat where you're like, I've lived a horrible life and my kids will probably never forgive me. It's that consistent witness that is so crucial, no matter what your past is. And uh, that's really what we get from the graces of the sacraments. So let me ask you guys, uh, we'll go back into the, this, this aspect, but I want to, want to say real quick, or ask real quick, how did you guys think of this uh, YouTube channel and, and getting each other together um, to do a podcast? Oh, well, um, I, I had, um, I go to Franciscan and I remember I was in the, I'm, I was in Trinity for people who know that I was in this Trinity chapel, which is one of the dorms. And um, I, I think for some reason, priest Robert King kept sticking with me, just that term itself. And I knew our call for baptism and all these kind of things, those three offices and how Jesus fulfilled those. Um, and I just remember hearing that from somewhere. I don't know, it might've been Bishop Barron or something like that. And I was like, that just sounds sick. Like, that's really cool. And, uh, initially, um, I'm very into clothing. I, I thought I could do something with like clothing involved with that. And so I started sketching a lot of ideas and, um, we actually made like a hoodie and a t-shirt, just one. We just kind of want to try it out a little test trial. And then we were kind of like, ah, you know what, we'll kind of just sit on it for a little bit and see how it goes. And then a year later, um, my dad's been having podcasts. And then me and Kenny are like, dude, why don't we try it? Like, it's just fun, you know? I mean, there's not too many people that will see it. So, you know, we can't embarrass ourselves that much. And so um, we did it. And they're like, this is sick. Why don't we do one? And then I had a name. And I was like, wait a second, there's three of us, Priest Prophet King. Let's just roll with that. And so we already had a logo and a lot of these things. So I felt like it just fit. And we're like, this is fun. Let's just keep doing it. That is awesome. Now, how have you guys grown as brothers and uh, father and son through this? Um, I think it's more consistent dialogue pertaining to the faith because of what we are trying to um, relay to our, our listeners. You know, if we, if we want to act like we're about it on a podcast, we have to actually be about it in real life. And we have accountability partners, you know, God blessed us with it um, in the home. And, you know, so I think that the podcast helped us to, you know, we're talking about different ideas. We are able to, you know, reflect on those ideas in our own life and how, you know, all of us are at different stages in life. And so that topic that we are, we are wanting to present on is going to hit us differently. And so we have to relay it to our listeners differently. Um, and so I think it's just um, helped us grow to understand each other better because of the fact that we are all trying to, grow in our faith and that's really our goal of the podcast is help other people grow in their faith um in a way that's relatable and and walking with them and not just you know pulling their hair but um it's helped us to yeah have a better understanding of each other um in re when it relates to the faith because we had an understanding when it comes to basketball we had understanding with fitness and everything but really talking about the, the difficult stuff the stuff about our salvation um oftentimes took a, a backseat and, and the podcast really brought it to the forefront. That's awesome. Now, um, if you haven't already subscribed to their channel, please do that now. As you can tell, these guys are great. They don't water down the faith by any means. So um, that's, that's always exciting to hear. And what I love, this is what I love about YouTube, right? And, and Catholic YouTubers in, in particular, is that like, you guys will probably, you guys might appeal to like people that would like see me and be like, oh, 
I'm not gonna watch that guy, you know? So I just think that's so cool. And uh, that's why like some of you may be watching and be like, man, that guy on whatever side of the screen is in that gray shirt. Like, I don't like him, but those guys are awesome. So you got to check them out. And uh, all about promoting Catholic YouTubers here. So it's good because the more of us that are saying this message, even in our own different ways, the Holy Spirit works in many different ways through many different people. It's going to bring glory to God. So I'm happy uh, to hear that. Now, John, how has it been for you having a podcast with your sons? Oh man, it's, it's such a huge blessing, right? I think, you know, we ended, um, was it 2019? So my last, I, I did a, I was doing a, I started off with a podcast called True Faith Real Talk, where I was just doing different interviews and whether it be pe people like, you know, Deacon Harold Bricksivers, Father Callaway, I've had on a couple of times. Um, I've had, you know, different people like uh, Tim Gordon on and just all Doug Berry. So I've, I've been introduced to different Catholic personalities and at the end, you know, we're kind of talking about it and it was just like, oh, let's do a, you know, my last episode of the year on how to keep your kids Catholic. And um, it was just like something that a lot of people were interested in. And, and so for me, it was like when Miko and the boys came up with it, I was just like, well, yeah, it's a dad's dream for us to get, you know, to name it Priest, Prophet, King. So now it, we know it. I mean, you can't hide from being, you know, Catholic in that sense. Um, and then it's just every every opportunity I talk about the two things that matter the most in my life are my faith and my family. And so every episode that we shoot, every, all the feedback we get opportunities like this is just a proud dad moment, right? It's just, it's humbling. It, it, it shows you the power of God when you surrender your life to him and let him take control. So for me as a dad, it's awesome. I'm like, you guys want to record episodes? Let's do it. You know, it's like <laughs> Mix was saying about you reaching out. I was like, that's awesome. You know, praise be to God. Let's do it. Um, because, you know, where we're headed and where we are now, we're completely different worlds. And so I'm, I'm just super grateful to God, um, grateful for every opportunity that we get to spend talking about the things that we love the most. And that's first and foremost, our faith. And our Man, that is amazing. So it's funny when you were saying that, John, I was thinking, uh, I've got like the setup and these lights and all this stuff. And as you guys do, I'm sure you're set. I mean, you guys got like the sweet microphones and everything, man. I got like the $20 <laughs> one from Amazon. So, uh, but Dominic and Michael, they're so cute. They're identical twin boys and they, they just love being behind the lights and, and when they're in videos, it's so cute. So it would be so cool for like 20 years from now for me to be like in your guys' spot doing like videos with my sons. Like that is so cool to think about, yeah. you know? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So it's just so cool. The, I mean, I don't know of anyone out there that's doing what you guys are doing, you know, father and son or mother and daughter, like that, that's just so amazing. So I really give you guys kudos and and uh, I'm so glad to, to help spread the message. Um, so again, subscribe if you haven't already. But um, Miko, uh, you came up with this idea. Yep. And uh, is, has it been like so amazing to see it like really come, really to, fruition? come to fruition? Yeah, it has. I mean, we just finished on doing a year of it. And I don't think, um, I think you have to be patient, one, because you – you know, you have this great idea and we're all passionate and we're all motivated. I'm sure you have some experience with your channel you want to blow up because you, just like you said, we're like, no one's doing this. We're just three brown guys just trying <laughs> to show the faith. There's not a ton of us out there. And so it, there's no reason why I shouldn't blow up in two months. And so that part, I think I had to check myself and just be humble because the, the idea is that as long as we save one soul, we help one soul, then that's, that's the job that we're supposed to do. And that's enough for, you know, our podcast. And so I've tried to, I've tried to humble myself and do that. But other than that, at the end of the day, we just have fun. Like Keone was saying, we, we challenge each other just with ideas and we come, you know, I, I said, Hey, I listened to father Ripker on this. And then he listened to father Ripper on this. And then my dad listened to a different video. And so we're all just challenging each other and just helping each other grow, honestly. And I think, um, even if no one was watching or if one person was watching, we still have a ton of fun and, uh, yeah, it's been awesome. I, and I, and just with the people that I've reached out, you know, like some of my friends from high school and stuff that wouldn't, uh, usually watch anything that has to do with faith. Like, no, no, they would never come across a channel like ours um, if it wasn't for, you know, people like us, I guess, doing the videos and for us to kind of like look the way that we are, however you guys want to take that. Um, <laughs> um, and so there's just been, a, you know, a lot of bright spots in this kind of long journey of a year so far where it's been uh, very reassuring. And um, yeah, it just feels good because I think I just know that we're doing God's will. You know, you talk about like, like one soul at a time kind of approach. And, and that's, that's where I think it's so critical to remember that, you know, maybe you guys don't have, you know, people watching don't have YouTube channels or whatever, but you can be just like John is and just like Miko and Keanu are. You can be the ones that like help 
bring the faith to your family in a normal way. You know, uh, I think it's so important to have these conversations about faith and to have it be like a continual aspect in your life, not just something that you do on Sunday and like, that's it. You know, um, it's, it's amazing to be Catholic and have the, the saints calendar and like every day is a different saint. And, and uh, it's, it's just such a great blessing. Now, um, John, I, a question I'd, I'd like to ask you is when, when kind of going back to the whole, like growing in your faith and keeping your kids Catholic, mm-hmm. when you, when you faced that resistance, what did you do? Uh, you know, I pray for the grace of God to, to, to remain humble. Um, you know, I'm a person that came from a lot, a lot of abuse. So anger was a big part of my life, right? And my kids even saw some of that. So that's a natural temptation that the devil knows how to use to, especially w- within the context of the family life where, um, you know, I had, to re- I had to remember that my kids had every right, I mean, my wife included, had every right to feel the way they felt, right? Because um, they saw, they saw the, the conflict, they saw the, how incongruent things were, what I said versus what I did. Um, and so, uh, you know, and I experienced that growing up. I, I grew up in a very do as I say, not as I do environment. And that we know how that works out. It doesn't because, you know, kids are smart enough to see right through it. So for me, it was really about growing in virtue. I mean, to be, to be quite honest. And then for every man out there, especially, but every parent who thinks that they may have, you know, uh, you know, contributed to the lack of faith in their kids' lives or, or in their spouse's life, you know, you have to humble yourself before God and before your family, right? If my family really meant everything to me, I needed to bend the knee before God in order to bend the knee before them and ask for their forgiveness. And so I think it was really about um, realizing where that came from, right? You know, it's natural to, to feel hurt when the people that are supposed to lead you and love you don't, right? And I think that's what happened with both my wife and, and, and my children. So trying to see it from their perspective. And, you know, if I was really uh, about the change, right, then I had to, to show that, I had to prove that. And it didn't matter you know, true charity, if you think about it, um, it, it it's, it's not doing something to get a certain response. It's not doing something to mm-hmm. get a certain end result. It's about doing it for, for God's sake and for the sake of that person that you say you love. And so if I really loved my wife and my kids and I was willing to go, you know, uh, to the gauntlet form, I was. I mean, I had to prove that. And so, um, you know, there was a lot of times I had to eat crow. There's a lot of times that I had to... Uh, really just practice reticence. And that's good for me for somebody who struggles with pride and somebody who struggles with um, those specific temptations. So it was really the grace of God. You know, I, I, you know, if I, re- if I relied on myself, which I did for a long time, I see where that ended up. And so, you know, I was tired of being the devil's puppet in the playground for him. And it was all about being, uh, you know, it's like when I think about the St. Louis de Montfort consecration, right? So I have, we all have the, the consecration. We do a consecration here. I think about when people ask me about it, I just simplify it this way. I used to be a slave to the devil. Now I'm a slave for Christ. And I think that's the point, right? That if you're going to truly be that man, um, you need to be able to humble yourself and you're not going to do it outside of God's grace. Mm, that is so true. Now, Keona, you mentioned before how you, you faced a lot of challenges with your dad. What was that, what was that moment that, that really like allowed you to soften your heart and like be like, all right, this is, this is what it is, you know? Yeah, you know, it's funny. It was actually when I was away from him that I was mm. uh, able to grow cl- the closest to him. So I, throughout high school, I was, we were butting heads or butting heads and it got a little bit better um, my senior year. Um, and then I decided to go to Franciscan, kind of taking a leap of, of faith, never saw the campus, never even knew really much about it. Um, but I decided to go. And um, it was through that experience of where you see this, like they call it the Catholic Disneyland and it, it pretty much is and you see just catholic everywhere there's a church there's friars walking around there's sisters in your class i'm like what is going on here and i saw a lot of the things that they were doing i knew of i knew about that rosary i knew about the importance of prayer not because i was doing it but because my dad was doing it and that was a a huge moment for me because even when i would butt heads with him when i would resist he would still do that and if i didn't see it I wouldn't have been prepared for what was coming my way and being exposed to the biggest Catholic school in the country, arguably. And so I was just really thankful, like, wow, I, I do know, you know, I do know my faith more than I thought I did. And it wasn't something that was so bad. And I got that from someone. And 
realizing and humbling myself to say, you know, my dad helped me with that. Even though I have, you know, my wounds or my anger towards him, it, that was what really softened my heart. And I was like, okay. And I think just over time with continual um, communication and his support, um, it just, it just grew from that. And my heart continued to soften and we got stronger and stronger. You know, Ray, I was going to add just to that because we'd be remiss to, to not mention my wife because behind every good man is a great woman, right? And I think yes. women, um, the way they're designed and built, you know, from, from the internal side of this, I think Archbishop Fulton Sheen had, had reflected this on this on one time in one of his sermons where, you know, for us as men, Adam was made from the, from the dust, right? And so we're very much caught up in the externals whereas our wives are made from within, right, from Adam's um, side. And so they're just more open to God and more open to the faith. And that was very much the case with my wife. And so, you know, she really was the impetus. You know, God knew I needed a, that woman to get me back to him. So I always tell the story that she was the one who brought me back to the one. And um, so for the, the wives out there who may be struggling because maybe their husbands aren't where they need to be or their, their sons um, or daughters aren't where they need to be, never underestimate the efficaciousness of your prayers, right? That your prayers as a mother and as a spouse um, are super efficacious and are going to be used to purify the souls that have been entrusted to you. So, you know, shout out to my wife, uh, Nicole, who, and their mom, who absolutely is um, probably one of the most critical points in all of this conversion. I had to say yes, and I had to do my part. And social science will show you that you know, um, that fathers have a big role, especially when it comes to the faith life and their uh, the lives of their children specifically. But there's a lot of wives who are bearing a huge cross because we men aren't doing what we need to do. So just a quick shout out. You know, I don't want to be to be too much about uh, me as a man or a role because for a long time I wasn't doing what I needed to do and my wife was. Um, but her her love, her mercy, her forgiveness and her, her um, I guess, her perseverance perseverance and commitment to the vows that we made before God um, was absolutely a, a core piece to all of this as well. That is amazing. Now, Keone, um, oh, but first, I definitely want to echo that. You know, you <laughs> wives are amazing. And thanks be to God for the gift of marriage and, uh, you know, the beauty of the complementarity of spouses. So mm -hmm. we could talk about that forever. What's something that the three of you would encourage parents to not do when uh, trying to keep their kids in the faith and on fire for Christ? Yeah, I would say as, as a parent in, in particular, um, I think we, we, we spoke a little bit about this, but this idea of the, the kind of doing it because I said so, um, you know, we talked a little bit about the why, but, you know, if, if faith is important to you, the people around you need to see that, right? And I think it was... Um, Pope Paul VI and Evangelii Nuntiandi, when he talks about uh, evangelization in the modern world, right? That modern man more willingly listens to witnesses rather than teacher. Uh, and if they listen to teachers, it's because they were witnesses first. And I think it's the same thing with us. We're the primary educators of, of the family and the faith. And so if my kids see me only as somebody who's just like iron fist or um, it, it's incongruent with my, my, my words and my actions, then they're gonna see right through that. They'll listen to me to the point where they feel like they don't need to anymore. Right. And so I would say as a parent, the thing not to do is to um, make faith this militant, uh, disciplinary kind of punishment kind of perspective. Um, again, you still have to be a parent. Right. So that doesn't mean, well, John, John said, I don't have to tell my kids to get up and get dressed and let's go to mass. No, you got to do what you got to do as a parent. But I would say um, the same way that you're trying to uh, exercise um, instruction teaching of the faith is the same we also have to be mindful of the caring and compassion the pastoral aspect of you being the priest of your home but i would ask these guys because they would they would definitely know uh what i shouldn't be doing <laughs> yeah well i i think part of that's one big thing is especially for parents who are just starting out with young kids you know you as you grow to for them to know the why to for them to grow in knowledge to actually fall in love with the faith i think that's huge but for those parents who are like maybe my dad, who the kids are already, you know, middle school, high school, even college, whatever, and they're trying to change and bring their kids back into the faith. I think it's important to exercise a lot of humility and prudence because, you know, you can try to drag them back because you're, you know, converted or whatever the, the, the term you want to use. But if they're not ready for that, that's not your job 
to make them ready for that in that moment because that wouldn't be prudent. And so I think it's, it's important to be patient with them, to be like, okay, they're not ready for that Sunday rosary. Just the fact that they went to mass with me is, is a start, you know, and, and we'll work up to that. And I, I find when people are, you know, parents who may have this, this, uh, um, this fire lit up in their hearts and they're converting, they're like, okay, now I'm going to change everything right now. And it's like, whoa, 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 but there's other souls who have other attachments, who are used to a different, who are used to different parents living a different life you need to be patient with them first. So just, just being really humble as a parent and, um, and exercising the prudence to meet your kids where they're at. Uh, I'd say for what not to do, I think uh, we've come across a lot of families, a lot of my friends, and I think in like specific examples is those people who are like, oh, well, we're traveling a lot. So when we travel, we, we don't, you know, we can't find a church. It's too hard. We're, we're going to LA and back and we're flying and doing all those things. Like, don't be that parent. Because my dad was always like, whatever I, coach I had or whatever's going on hey on Wednesdays like he has confirmation on Wednesdays we have catechism so like he's not gonna be able to make it and just doing those things because the more that a parent makes excuses right oh we're traveling oh well he has practice he can't come to catechism this week how are you gonna come back later on and say hey no no no, you need to why aren't you putting your faith as priority well we never did as a family so how do you expect me to now and so I think that's mm-hmm. a huge one because I think especially in this like sports busy world a lot of parents tend to do that they make uh, excuses for them and their entire family as a white go to church because they're so busy watching bachelor every monday that they can't make mass on sunday or whatever it is and so that would be my not to do you know that's actually a great point that i'm gonna have to tack on to that too right because i think we're so um caught up in the worldly things sometimes as parents we want to get our kids over committed and so what i hear a lot um because uh, one of the primary demographics that i actually go and speak to is is youth and young adults and specifically confirmation teens, right? And I think what you hear out there is they're just so overwhelmed, they're so busy. So what ends up happening is they're not on one travel team, they're on two, right? They're not in, you know, they're not just doing piano lessons, they're doing some other type of lesson, right? Because they're trying to fill up that resume for that, you know, that, that nice, you know, college uh, career that they're going to have, you know, so that way they can be indoctrinated into, you know, Marxism or something. But anyway, um, I digress. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, the, the, they're so focused on building up that resume that faith has become something that they, they do, not something that they live. And it becomes a choice in the matter. So if I've got a choice between, um, you know, playing the sport that I love versus catechism, I want to do the sport that I love because it's, chore, it's a chore to learn about the faith. And so that's one thing I will say that uh, I learned late in life um, with the boys is that I actually stood in the gap for them whenever a coach or whatever that would say, oh, you know, you can't, you're not going to this high school retreat. Because um, we have a, a big tournament that weekend, and it's going to impact your playing time. Most parents, especially dads out there, would do what? Oh no, you got to go to that tournament because you're not. You know, I need you to be a starter, right? I mean, you're going to go be D one, right? Um, I know you're only two foot five, but you know, whatever, it's all good, right? But what what I do is I'd go and talk to that coach, pull him to the side, and said, "Hey, I'm going to let you know from day one that if you ever step between God and family, um, you'll lose that battle 100 percent of the time." And so we need to be men and we need to stand up. And it actually speaks volumes to those coaches or those administrators or whatever. So those two points were don't overcommit your kids and give them a life of busy. They don't know how to disconnect now, especially with technology. So don't overwhelm them. Give them just the right doses of the things. And the, the biggest dose should be the faith. And the second thing is be a parent. Make the decisions when it comes to those, those difficult decisions so your kid doesn't have to. Even if they don't understand it and they'd rather be at that tournament, trust me. It'll pay off. That was awesome. I can only imagine a coach hearing that from you like, oh, you're going to lose every day. You know, <laughs> if it's God versus sports, God wins every day because I'm yeah. sure they never hear that. So that's amazing. <laughs> you, you mentioned earlier how, uh, you know, sometimes the kids might not want to wake up and go to mass. Yeah. Um, have you ever faced that resistance? And if so, how did you handle it? Um, you know, the one thing I have going for me is, is the intimidation factor, right? So these kids know that when I say do something, um, it's going to be one look. And uh, so there's that part of me that they would say, well, yeah, you know what, we'll test dad, but we're not going to test him like that. So if I say, hey, um, get up, we're going to mass, it's get up and go to mass. Um, and so I would say, <laughs> I, I captain, right? It's like, well, we're doing it. Uh, so, you know, I think the parents out there, once they see you bend, like Gumby, they're going to test that, you know, kids are going to test the, the boundaries. But once you make sure that boundary is clear, like I'm not, I'm not, it's not even an argument. It's not a debate that was, you must have thought that was a question mark. It was actually an exclamation point. We're going to mass. 
right? And you're going to be, I don't care if you're, and you're going to be quiet the entire time, that kind of thing. So to be quite honest, brother, if, if there was ever resistance, it was maybe the stink eye, probably behind my back. Um, but, you know, as a parent, I'm not there to be their friend. I'm, better, I'm there to be their father. That's what they need. And so yeah. if parents are more about being friends with their kids, that's your first problem. But these kids need a father. These wives need husbands. They don't need landlords and, and roommates, right? And so learn the difference. Man, all right, we got to do another episode on like this stuff because uh, this is good. I can learn a lot from you, John. Yeah, you got it, brother. You got it. Man, that's good. Okay, so have you guys done the St. Joseph consecration? Yep. Mm-hmm. Isn't it awesome? It is. We're gonna, and we'll do the same one coming up to end on um, obviously the solemnity on March 19th. So when Father Callaway first came out with it, uh, you know, we connected, I connected with him. I brought him back on my podcast. We hooked up and we did that first consecration with his book. And so, um, we do an annual Marian consecration. And now that we have a book that actually does it, we'll do an annual uh, St. Joseph consecration. So It's a game changer, isn't it? Amazing. You have the book, right? You have Father, you have Father Callaway's book? Nice. There you go. I know. So if you have, do you have his champions of the rosary book? I do. Okay. So you know how his, he, just the work that he does, the research that he does on both those fronts. So I just love how much, um, research and information you get from it. So it's not like you're just going through a spiritual consecration, which is important, but you actually get the, the historical understanding. Of all exactly. Stuff. Oh, also yeah. plug, just uh, did a video with Father Callaway. So click the link in <laughs> over here or over here, wherever it is. So it, it was a great video, man. It's been a pleasure talking with you all. I hope you guys go check out their channel and their videos. As you can see, awesome guys. And it's just so amazing to sit here and talk with other brothers in Christ. I never met them. You know, and we had a great conversation because we love Jesus and Jesus does amazing things. So uh, anything else you guys want to say? Thanks for having us. You did. You did a great job. We love what you're doing. And just the, the joy of faith is really lived out in you. Like we see it and it, it resonates with us. Like, you know, to put that smile on our face, to live it out with joy. So it's, it was a pleasure. Yeah. I appreciate I that. that. I would say the same thing, like everything. I think the most important job you have, my brother, is as husband and as father. And it's just a blessing to be um, one in Christ with you. So thanks for having us on. Thanks for promoting us. Um, Most importantly, thanks for your prayers and for uh, your witness in the faith. Yeah, just subscribe. You know, that'd be nice. <laughs> just check, just check out our channel, man. It'd be sweet <laughs> if if you can help us out, and if 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 you can, we can get to the uh, the joy of faith status, you know, get into the thousands of people out there. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's crazy. I, I'm I'm amazed. I'm just as shocked as you guys are. You know, it's like, man, you got a big channel. I'm like, I know, I don't know how it happened. <laughs> so, I mean, I do, but it's it's all God. So, um, Amen. The Holy Spirit does crazy stuff. Literally, like. There were videos that I've been editing and the Holy Spirit was like, no, it needs to look like that. It only happened once, but it was amazing. And uh, yeah. yeah, so God is good and being Catholic is amazing. And for all those fathers out there or mothers out there, I hope that this has brought you some hope and given you some nuggets to help you live as more virtuous parents and sons that are out there. I hope this has encouraged you to foster that relationship with your dad. Maybe he isn't in the faith and this can help encourage you or he is, but you can help grow his faith because we know it, it goes both ways. So mm-hmm. I uh, appreciate all you guys are doing and uh, it's amazing to see this father son ministry and I hope it grows. And uh, one day I'm like, Oh man, can I come on your channel? You got such a huge channel. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'd be great. That would be awesome. That'd that be would something. be awesome. <laughs> I know. With, with God, all things are possible, right? So, Amen. Amen. Yes. Well, please like this video, share it with others, and uh, subscribe to their channel. So hope you all have a blessed day, and God love you.